Uh, we are so lucky to have as a participant in this. Uh, I was going to. I don't know what to call it. Is it? It's. It's more than television at this point. This is. Um, Let's call it a public conversation. Good. Good. David Cobb and his current role as spokesman for Move to Amend. And the amendment in particular is concerned with the illegitimate legal doctrine that a corporation can claim to be a person with inherent constitutional rights. Now a story I tell David is that in those times I spent in a law library one of my passions was the Ninth Amendment, which Justice Greenberg, before he was a justice, wrote a uh, book about called The Forgotten Amendment. And I looked in the law library, and what they have, the way they used to arrange the law library, the West Publishing Company, was to have annotations mm -hmm. in the form of uh, paragraphs of the main part, the useful language from a particular published opinion of some court or other. And in the so when it came to the Ninth Amendment, there's a bunch of books and you pick the amendment. It doesn't get its own, I think they include it with the Tenth, because there do. aren't that many pages, you know, like maybe 12 pages, <laughs> maybe 30 by now. But the Fourteenth Amendment, at that point, and this was in the 80s, I guess, was two big volumes and they yeah, were one. Their own books. Yeah. And the Fourteenth Amendment is, is a corporation amendment. Sadly, it is, uh, Joe. Remember that the 14th Amendment says that no person shall be denied equal protection of the law and no person shall be denied due process of the law. Now, that's important to understand that the 14th Amendment was, was passed in order to protect the formerly enslaved human beings, Africans, who had been enslaved clearly illegitimately, uh, but finally the Civil War abolished the legal doctrine and the 13th Amendment specifically abolishes slavery in the United States and the 14th Amendment is designed to ensure that the formerly enslaved persons would have all constitutional rights and protections. So therefore, no person shall be denied equal protection of the law. But, da 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 da, we of the law do wonder in a morbid way about the choice of the use of the word persons at that moment in legislative history. <laughs> that they set it up because they knew that in fact, even though they were playing it up that this is a grand gesture of generosity to the blacks, they knew this was going to be the corporations. Well, I would say it this way, Joe. Uh, it's clear that on the language it only meant human beings. Obviously, only a human being is a person. Any sane, rational person knows that to be true. Uh, and, of course, the corporatos, uh, the corporatists, the imperialists, the ruling elite uh, of the day, immediately began to try to claim that they were, their clients, their corporations were persons for the purposes of the 14th Amendment. But it's important to understand that for the first 10, 15 years that those cases were coming up, the court was rejecting that argument over and over and over again. You no, know, that is good news, brother. It is. I, so I just, like, there's the slaughterhouse cases. There's a, there's a whole series of, of cases. What I am going to uh, acknowledge, though, the truth of, uh, of your underlying question or comment, and that is that ultimately, uh, in the, a outrageous uh, decision called Santa Clara County versus Pacific Railway, it made its way into a head note, this idea of corporate personhood. And then later, case after case after case, fully briefing, fully arguing the illegitimate, preposterous notion that a corporation should be considered a person with those constitutional rights. And Joe, I want to back up for a moment for the non-lawyers in the group. I mean, corporate personhood is stupid on its face, right? That a corporation should be a person doesn't make any sense. But it's even deeper than that, because remember that to have constitutional rights means that you as a human being can say certain things, do certain things, assemble, that you have core human rights 
that you can exercise and you do not need government's permission. And if government tries to infringe upon those rights, government is wrong. You should be able to go into court and overturn any effort to, to forbid you from exercising your rights. So civil liberties are important. Constitutional rights are important. And corporations are simply concentrations of capital. They're simply ways to, or to, for people to organize to do business. And to say that this business entity known as a corporation, which can be used to do great good, oftentimes used to do great evil, but the fact is that this corporate entity can claim constitutional rights is a perversion of the democratic promise uh, inherent in the U.S. Constitution. You did say that. Well, let me just, in my slow, dumb way, rephrase it. But I am very appreciative how well you're pointing out the points involved here. And they are that when we um, pride ourselves as a country with freedom and the cherishing of the individual rights, human rights as cherishing the, the beauty of the individual sovereignty, that one person is capable of such a presumption of wonderful things, that we're supposed to treat individuals with mystery, but a generous kind of mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, freedom is really hoping for wonderful things to happen and, and allowing that to happen. And the tension between the individual and the government, the more freedom there is, the more respect for individual sovereignty and the thriving of individuality and the genius of the individual and those things that free enterprise brags about among the businessmen, Henry Ford and Ted Turner, the individual genius, they, they appeal to this um, enthusiasm about the individual. And so you have the individual versus the state and the, the judge, the justice system is supposed to weigh the rights of the individual and be generous about it versus the powers and interests of the state. But I want to And then you say, but when the corporations glom onto that, that's the perversity. It is the perversity, but I also want to be uh, even more clear that the judges are not supposed to weigh the interest of the individual versus the state in this sense that individual rights are sacrosanct. Um, and I the U.S. government, though, is not merely about individual rights. It, so individual rights are sacrosanct. In addition to that, let's understand that there is a deep communitarian ethos even in the Constitution, because we the people have all the power. We the people are sovereign, but we create government. So government is properly understood how when we come together in a communitarian way to talk about the social contract. So we are collectively the government, and that's the beauty, that yes, in a dem we are a democratic republic, which means that the people collectively rule, but here's the kicker. The governmental action can never, under any circumstances, violate the individual rights of a human being. Now, that doesn't mean that I get to win all of the public decisions, but it means that when government comes together, they cannot actually infringe upon my core rights. And the only time the balance uh, should come into play is if there's a question about whether my individual rights are actually at stake. Oi! Well, I um, am amazed because I have been on a path since 1969 in which I was challenging the marijuana laws. Ah. And the marijuana laws... Thanks for your good work, because you're, you're finally starting to see the fruits of your labor. <laughs> I should have seen them sooner. But, <laughs> but uh, the way I have um, limited myself to seeing the weighing that we're talking about is that the official proposition, the way the idea gets handled by our language in the legal system is that upon the demonstration to the court that constitutionally protected rights are at stake vis-a-vis -vis not allowing individuals to smoke marijuana, that to the extent you can find some rights to assert, then 
there's some judicial language that says we're going to weigh. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to weigh, they have two ways of weighing or three ways of weighing. One way of weighing is can the representative of the state, which is the DA, the state prosecutor, the secretary general, but in particular the secretary general, can they demonstrate to the court and then what is the language they use? The next word is interest. Right. Now that is a kind of a, they didn't say power. No. <laughs> they said interest. Can they show an interest in the state, for the state, of for it, that is so great. A compelling interest. That they are compelled. Oh, they didn't want to do it, but. <sighs> now, in the case that I brought to the Supreme Court, the, the court that ruled me down resorted to language which is uh, way down in the sewer. It's like you don't go any lower than that. They relied on a case that held that the legislature had determined there was a compelling state interest. That's a bad joke. And five years after my case, finally Berger did get excited out loud and say, hey, judges are not supposed to talk like that. <laughs> right. That the compelling state interest test is the court in its own independent judgment, deciding if they're compelled not to wait and see if the legislature and so forth. So, again, I was like bragging, I know that story about compelling and this and that, but you're saying, hey, Joe, no, no, it's not supposed to be weighing that we, the people, create this government. The government is supposed to treat us as sovereign citizens, as having, anyhow, what are the rights for the marijuana? Do you have any ideas? Well, here's the idea. I mean, I, I'm not sure about that because I also want to be clear that we collectively come together. Uh, we elect our representatives who, who enact safety, health, and environmental laws. I think that the, the issue at stake in marijuana, actually, we should look at California, Colorado, the 20 other states where the sovereign exercise of collective power known as the government are passing state laws, making it very clear that there are circumstances where in those governments, uh, we have said uh, marijuana can be used uh, for certain reasons. And it is illegitimate for the national government now to attempt to preempt or override the sovereign states. That I think is the, if I were a marijuana activist, that's where I would actually be focusing my energies because there you actually have the democratic state actually challenging the national federal government on this. And the reality is that states are responsible for laws re regarding the safety, health, and public welfare. And all the prior marijuana prohibition laws have always been about the, the state's compelling interest in the state Pub, uh, safety, health, and public welfare. So all these states that are now beginning to say it's in the state's interest uh, to create mechanisms for legalization, decriminalization, uh, etc. I predict that the federal, uh, the FDA, the, uh, the the feds are on the wrong side of this. And frankly, we're going to see marijuana completely legalized. Um, within a decade in this country because the, the culture has shifted so radically, so uh, drastically, uh, and you're seeing the people exercise their sovereign right to autonomy, to self-government, and they're doing it at the local and state level, where they should. That was good. That, uh, that is a hot issue right now, that if the states finally come around and at least legalize it for medical purposes, Uncle Sam has no business offering their two cents when, I will give you this story, which you may know, but the listener might benefit from. I would offer this story in, for the proposition that the marijuana laws were conceived in sin. <laughs> and the sinner was Frederick Vinson. That Frederick Vinson on the sly, in secret, conspired with Harry Anslinger of the narcotics agency of the government to increase his empire by making marijuana illegal. Now at that moment in history, somewhere around 1939, 
Frederick Vinson was a U.S. congressman who was head of the Finance Committee. And so he cooked up the idea of making marijuana illegal by making it a marijuana tax act as opposed to considering the health and safety consequences and then it would go to some other committee he didn't have control of. So they came up with the Marijuana Tax Act and at the committee hearing the American Medical Association sent a representative who was both a lawyer and a doctor, quite a guy. And you can read, you can read their exchange on the internet just Googling it in the obvious way, Frederick Vinson Committee. And there is an exchange in which Frederick Vinson gets nasty and insulting. And he's obviously pissed off that the AMA guy says that they are against his legislation. <laughs> they don't want the government messing around with marijuana. Just leave it alone. It's a useful item in their pharmacopoeia, whatever they call it, pharmacopoeia. In other words, it's useful. It's an herb. The body has cannabis receptors throughout most of its systems, throughout the nervous system, the hormone system, the digestive system. And Vincent comes back with, well, a couple of years ago, I remember an article where the AM, hey, listen, pal, Whatever we said before, our position now is we don't want this to happen. When the legislation got to the floor of Congress for the big vote, yes or no, someone among the legislature called out, what is the AMA's position? And Frederick Vinson announced to all present the AMA was totally for it. He lied. And after serving for Truman in different positions in Treasury and this and that, this guy became the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. And so the demonization of marijuana was arbitrary politics. And if I had been a good enough lawyer to keep banging away at the justice side, I didn't have to wait for 55% of the American public in a poll to say they're for the legalization of marijuana. The courts should have said, well, if there are fundamental constitutionally protected rights at stake, then the case against marijuana by the legislature has to be some rational basis in established scientific fact. And what are the facts? And the facts are that whenever the U.S. government funds a study about what are the effects of marijuana, if the effects turn out to be good, the U.S. government doesn't publish. <laughs> That's the reality. That there, in other words, marijuana has been politics, not science. And in the face of politics, not science, the courts should have defended the marijuana user even at the individual level. If it was just one among a thousand, an individual right is supposed to prevail. But what about that? Well, I agree with that. Uh, and from my perspective, uh, look, I don't use marijuana. Uh, I advocate that it should be decriminalized as a matter of uh, health policy because I think that uh, marijuana use is really, uh, you know, it, it is a drug that's very clear and therefore it should be treated as a uh, social policy uh, issue. I agree with you that the criminalization of marijuana was uh, a political act. It was done clearly in an effort uh, to, for the corporate control, specifically uh, around the oil and chemical industry and the use of resins that were, that, uh, uh, were being used there, and also paper, actually. Uh, um, but what I'd like to do, so I agree with all of that, but frankly, I'm here because I am a representative for a growing movement of people that are talking about economics, that are talking about the fact that we should have economic democracy in this country, that we the people have the right to control these large transnational corporations, which are the dominant institution of our culture, they're the dominant institution of our times, and corporate personhood, Joe, uh, is the ridiculous proposition that says that these entities now somehow have those inherent rights of a human being, that you have, that I have, that your viewer has, that, that all of us have um, as human beings, and that therefore, corporate lawyers should be able to go into court 
and make these same arguments on liberty and freedom uh, that you should be able to make, that I should be able to make, that your viewer, the living, breathing human being, should be able to make. So I'm proud to tell you that we have over 140,000 Americans and growing every day going to this website, move to amend.org and if we've got the magic right now somewhere along the bottom of the screen the the words move to amend may be appearing and if so i'm going to encourage the viewers to go to that website move to amend.org sign up on that petition so we can be in touch with them and if they would like to talk to a living breathing human being call us at 707 269 0984 because we want to connect human being to you to human being engage citizen to engage citizen we are nonviolent revolutionaries joe we take ourselves seriously we are uh, conducting ourselves uh, with a plan we have a strategy we have tactics uh, we are passing resolutions now in city by city county by county uh, i honestly predict uh, that within 10 to 15 years, the political shift in this country is going to be that we see a, an opening up uh, of uh, genuine civil liberties and a closing down of corporate power. Because I am a civil libertarian. I absolutely believe that individuals have the rights that you and I have been talking about. And it is the appropriate role of the courts to come in anytime there are uh, efforts made by the state or uh, it, whether it's the local, state, or federal uh, governmental agencies to re, uh, that restrict upon our actual core human rights. However, economics is appropriately a political decision, and how it is that we organize uh, our society and our economics ought to be something that we, the people, have a right to exercise our sovereign rights to do so. The amend movement at this point, as you describe it, is somewhat a first step insofar as being only the beginning of the kind of power relationship we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis the corporation. I think the winning argument for the amend, uh, taking away uh, corporate personhood, is that our legal system gives the individual the benefit of doubt which is huge. It's huge. And corporations don't deserve any benefit of doubt because they're basically uh, systematically abusing that right. That's exactly right, Joe. And just a, a quick little uh, history lesson for folks to really put it into context. We know that today the corporation is the dominant institution of our culture. And I'll tell you this, and I know your viewers already know this. Large transnational corporations are not just exercising power today. They are ruling us. They're making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. They're deciding how much poison will be in the water that we're all collectively drinking. Corporate CEOs are making the decisions about how much toxics will be in the air that we're all collectively breathing. They're making the decisions about our transportation choices, about what our food choices are at the grocery store. Hell, they're making the decisions about the energy policy and whether or not this country goes to war. We've lost control of this country. The Occupy movement knows it, the Tea Party movement, and everybody in between knows that's the case. Now, Joe, listen to this. Do you know for the first 75 years of this country what it took to form a corporation? You had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government. It had to pass by a majority. Then that same bill went to the upper house, the state senate. It had to pass by a majority. Then the governor had to sign it. It was the functional equivalent of a law. You've tried to lobby to get laws passed. How hard is that? You know, that reminds me of NATO. Let, let me just uh, finish. The question then comes, whether they renew it should be the same thing, and then a constant ability to use that power to say, what have you been doing? We don't like what you've been doing. You shouldn't do it like that. But that control of the public over the corporation, frankly, never much happened in our culture? No, no, it did for the first 75 to 100 years, and that's the point I'm making. So that was the mechanics to even form a corporation. And get this, Joe, for the first 75 to 100 years, as difficult as the mechanics were to create a corporation, do you know how the long a corporate charter would last? 10 years at which point the corporate charter automatically dissolved, wow. and then you had to go through the process all over again. And, then, and I'm not even through. Let me finish, because okay, this is important okay. to yeah, walk yeah. through it all. Okay. This is an amazing hidden history. So the corporate charter, as difficult as it was to get it, only lasted 10 years. And then, 
to even get the privilege, not the right, but the privilege to incorporate and get limited liability, you had to prove that there was an existing public need that was not being met by either existing private business or by governmental action. Wow. And if you were ever found to do anything other than that very specific thing, your corporate charter could be revoked. And now let's go one step further. Even if you were doing the very specific thing that you were supposed mm. to do, and even if you were within the very limited time period, if you were ever found to act outside the public interest, do you know what happened to your corporate charter? How quick? It was revoked. The corporate death penalty could be uh, imposed. So these things that Nader talks about, and he talks well, the one thing that I want to be clear about, that's our historical legacy. That's how we treated these corporate forms for 75 to 100 years. And the issue of corporate personhood is one of the ways that the courts have stepped in and stripped away we the people and our right to be able to actually control these instruments of oppression. It does seem to me that there has become awe of the corporation and that if and when there was those moments when the legislature was to consider whether to give a corporation another 10 years of life, that in the current corrupt mentality of our government, it's like, oh boy, now we get to get some money from the lobbyists. You want to live or die? Okay, fork it over, guys. A uh, couple of thousand here, we might get 10. They, 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 I don't know exactly whether to blame the corporations totally on the corruption of our system, but our system at this point is so corrupt that my first challenging question oh, is, were there much bloody moments in the history where the, the governmental bodies, the state legislatures said, oh, we have considered your grand slogans when you're applying for the next 10 years and, and you use these generalities about how you've been serving the public, but hey, we got, uh, we got the deal on you. You did this and you did that and you cheated on that and you didn't, uh, have there been moments of heroic complaint against what corporations were doing? Yes, uh, ab absolutely yes. And, and it, actually, if you go to the website movetoamend.org, we actually give examples of corporate charters being revoked, corporate charters not being renewed. So there were moments like this. And I want to be clear, Joe, that I'm not saying that this was the land of milk and honey, that this was uh, a great place, because the reality is, for the first 75 years of this country, slavery existed. So slavery was the institution where, wherein many of the ruling elite were actually exploiting uh, and oppressing. Also, patriarchy existed. Women were not actually persons with constitutional rights at this point. And most men were not actually legally persons at this time because they didn't own enough property to actually have access to it. So there is something uh, that's very important to recognize that this notion of legal personhood, that is, that you have the ability to assert rights under law. Howard Zinn uh, once said that uh, one of the lenses of American history is a, to see it as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons under the U.S. Constitution. So, you know, today we know that finally, you know, slavery is over. Women can, uh, can vote. But let's just be clear that we don't have a functioning democratic republic because, because the, the corporations are now claiming that they're persons as well. All I'm saying is this. There is a historical legacy of properly controlling the corporate form. And the only time that we, the people, have been able to make this country a more democratic place, uh, a more fair place, a more just place, is when there has been a movement in the streets and an electoral arm and a political expression of that movement. I'm excited, Joe, because I'm seeing that movement in the streets happen now. Occupy Wall Street, uh, where I was today, uh, g giving a teach-in. Uh, around corporate personhood is spreading across the country. I've spoken now to about half a dozen different occupations. I'm on the road constantly. And if any of your viewers would like to, uh, to get me to your community, move to amend.org or 707-269-0984. I'd love to continue to come. I'm doing these workshops and lectures and, uh, and helping people uncover the hidden history. And how do we politicize this movement? which is to say, 
how do we actually make concrete demands within the political process so that we can have nonviolent revolution in this country and reclaim our sovereign right to govern ourselves? You know, in my mind, David, I'm wondering if your role as a leader of this movement that you have so articulated limits you to wondering with me uh, this big one. If uh, This is a, a question I cooked up to spring on um, lots of people, but in particular the, the residents of Liberty Park, and that is if the movement was fully, wonderfully successful, how do you picture things being? <laughs> And, you know, that's a sneaky way of saying, what, what do you want? But in particular, to go further than this first step, mm -hmm. I uh, don't know how to put it as far as sticking you on this, you know. But I think what is called for yes. is public ownership of the public corporations. Listen, I, I actually think that that's right. If you're going to get limited liability, uh, and if you're going to be publicly traded, then, then there you have it. But I would say this, that what if in our governmental structure, remember that people have rights and that the Constitution protects those rights. Okay, I agree with that. I think you do too. I think that another way to look at the Constitu or Constitution is as the codification of the social contract. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, Joe, I like the fact that I have individual rights that are sacrosanct, and I want, to I want to keep that part of the social contract, but I want to dig deeper and say, what if we said every human being in the United States of America has the right to enough food to eat? Sounds and that's good. A, that's a right that we'll codify in the Constitution, an affirmative right, uh -huh. not just a negative right. Again, government can't do this, but an affirmative right to enough food to eat. What if we went further and said every human being uh, should have a right to access to health care? What if we said that every human being had an actual right to adequate housing? What if we said that every human being had the right to clean air to breathe and clean water to drink? What if we started to actually talk about the fact that nature should have rights under, and that we were going to and the, what I'm describing now, Joe, is to take your question that you sprung, which is a fair one. Frankly, if any of us are calling for transformation, we've got to have a vision for what it looks like and how it would look like. I'm saying, what if we said our social contract was a loving, compassionate planet where we will respect the individual rights of the human being, uh, but we're also going to guarantee that uh, everybody amongst us has enough food to eat has clean air and clean water, that they have access to health care, and we start talking about positive rights. We could even go further than that and talk about a right uh, to, to an education. You know, those kinds of conversations are about what kind of society we want to live in. And since you and I as lawyers know, and probably some of your viewers have heard this phrase, that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. That ring a bell from law school, Joe? If the, Supreme, if the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land, shouldn't our supreme law talk not just about restrictions on government against you as an individual, but talk about how what rights the human being has beyond being protected from government, but what about what we have actively, proactively? So when you ask me what it would look like, I'd like to actually talk about um, a transformation of how we do economics, a transformation of how we view ourselves as individuals within the context of a society. Because you know what, Joe? And here's the kicker. There's enough to go around. There, there's enough to go around for us to actually nurture and take care of one another. There's enough for us to, 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 to begin the process of of letting go of the idea of greed and mindless accumulation and actually think about what would it look like if we actually nurtured and cared for one another and we had legal and political and economic institutions that were actually 
designed to do those things. And honestly, I think that's what most people want. Most Americans, whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Green, and a Libertarian, like really and truly what we want is community. We want to care for one another and to be cared for. We want to be in relationship in an appropriate and loving and compassionate way. And so when I say I'm a nonviolent revolutionary, I'm not joking. And I do have a vision, and I believe that we are capable of creating that world. Not just talking about it, but creating it and living in it. I like it, I like it. And I um, am glad to hear you're up for the challenge in um, sketching out a little more of the, the flesh of the revolution. I, I wanted to come back, though, to the public ownership of the corporations. That the 1%, 99%, uh, grip on our current situation that they have accomplished, the 1%, 99% argument, applies to corporations in this sense, that if we were to make the corporations public, what I mean by that is that instead of the management of the corporations feeling an obligation to perform for the benefit of their shareholders, if those shareholders weren't the 1% but the 99%, <laughs> then the question is how should a corporation be run? It should be run for the benefit of the public, that they should totally care about the public with all the decisions. And then we can have a discussion as a people, what do we want to do with all this economic power that is now owned by these corporations? What do we want to make? How do we want to make it? How do we want to treat the people? And in, in those terms, how do you imagine idealizing or perfecting or you know, making right the corporation? Well, I guess what I would say is this. I think in those terms, what I would like to say is, well, let's, let's shrink the size of uh, the privately held corporation. Because I think that there is a role for individual ownership. Uh -huh. I think that there is a role for entrepreneurship. I think that there is a role for creativity and to reward hard work and risk taking and such. So I don't want to make all economics completely socialized. Uh, socialized. Uh, I don't. So right. I, I just want to be clear that I don't think that that is appropriate. I do think, though, that it is appropriate to exercise the democratic accountability of economic institutions through appropriate laws, like the ones we used to have in this country. And I'm going to now remind you and viewers um, of the, the great thinker that the right wing loves to talk about, of Ron course, Adam, Adam Smith. Oops. <laughs> Adam Smith. Uh, but remember that Adam Smith, uh, who described the, the invisible hand of the market, also said that it is the government's uh, responsibility, nay, its sacred duty, to ensure that the actions of corporations do not allow them to grow so large as to become monopolies, and that it's government's role, nay, its sacred responsibility, to appropriately regulate these entities. And in fact, the joint stock companies, which were the transnational corporations of the day, Adam Smith railed against these and said that they should not be allowed to exist except in very unique circumstances where where uh, monopolies might actually have uh, make sense because of their things like you know electrical power generation or they need to be you need to amass so much capital to do certain things and then he said they should always be under democratic control never is it the case that the business class gathers together even for mirth and merriment but that the conversation does not become a conspiracy against the working class. Joe, Karl Marx said that? No, Adam Smith. <laughs> I just think that it's worth pointing out uh -huh. that, that it is possible, it's not either or, it's not either, um, you know. Uh, I concede that, I agree. I, I think that from everything we've learned from the right wing, left wing, economic schools, and so forth, that we do want economic institutions in which the individual entrepreneurial thing has a full opportunity. But uh, if we redesign society and cherish that, mm -hmm. then the giant corporations, they're sort of like... Uh, now you, I'm with you, because you just used the word the giant corporations. The huge giant uh, engines of economics should be publicly owned and publicly controlled. But I think that it's important for viewers to really consider and for you and I in this conversation to be clear that we're not saying 
that we want to socialize all economic activity we want to allow individuals to actually own a certain things we just don't want them to accumulate so much wealth and power that they become disproportionate and that they can uh, affect the the body politic the body politic is supposed to be that we're all basically equal before the law and equal before politics and have an equal opportunity to actually convince others of our ideas of how society should operate you know uh how many more minutes we got what number we got 41. Oh, we got plenty of time. We go to 58. Uh, I have up on the internet, uh, as of 1996, Joe Friendly's plan for peaceful but total revolution, in which I do try to score points in the direction you were mentioning of uh, appreciating out loud the full variety of economic uh, ways of doing, I mean, economic institutions, the individual, the, the group. I did want to make a couple of points though. Number one, corporations have a uh, hierarchical way of doing things that isn't quite kosher with the Jeffersonian notions of dignity. And that I want to stress early on as we begin to think out loud about what kind of institutions, economic institutions you want to create leadership only on the basis of freely given consent mm -hmm. and in particular in terms of hierarchies the people should be reasoned with rather than commanded of course and coercion it, itself is illegitimate in my estimation i mean you know the the reality is that you know what i think the right wing has done uh, a, a very effective job is that painting progressives or folks on the left uh, as if we don't value liberty but it's not true. I am a civil libertarian. Absolutely. I know you are simply by this conversation. I'm hearing you talk about the dignity of the human being and that we should uh, cherish our individual liberty. But it doesn't end there because we're communitarian. Hum like as human beings, that's actually our birthright as well to not only have individual liberty, but also to be engaged in a communitarian experience i mean that w and we're cooperators by nature joe i mean we would not have survived as primates if we had actually been the the sort of individualistic only out for ourselves ask ask any scientist ask any ethnobiologist ask anyone who studied the matter the only reason that we survived as a species is because we are cooperators by nature we are collaborators by nature the horror of the way the current a corporate capitalist system is operating is that it does not actually value genuine collaboration. It does not value cooperation. Instead, we've been taught a lie that we're actually all individualistic and all out for ourselves and only for ourselves. And we've got an economic system that's based on that premise. No wonder things are going afoul. I would add that the cure involves hoping out loud for our educational system to be pushing or nurturing, let's call it, the individual and this caring for the community. Mm -hmm. And the more empathy that you can encourage, the more individual aliveness of each student, their curiosity encouraged, their... We don't have that kind of education. No, we system. don't. It's funny, Joe, you know, for you ask, it, just look at it this way. The most important thing that any human child learns how to do is how to walk and how to talk. And they get into a public education process in this current society, and the first thing they're taught, sit down and shut up. You know? <laughs> Great, that's good. <laughs> and so to me, if we talk about our education system, then what we should say is, well, what would it look like if we design an educational system where we were encouraging not only creative thought, but critical thinking. That we really wanted uh, those human beings to prepare to take their rightful role in a functioning democratic republic where they understood that they had certain rights, but their rights did not, uh, that they did not have the right to encroach upon other people's rights. That they were, that they were going to have to learn collective uh, decision making and check this out, how to make and implement decisions in a democratic fashion. Allow me to tell one short personal story 
that brought it home for me. I'll never forget my mama tell, my mama taught me, and she doesn't remember this, but I certainly do. I was about four or five years old and arguing with my brother and my cousin, all three of us boys, and we were arguing over toy. Can't remember what it was exactly, but we were arguing with the toy on the floor. And I remember my mama came up to us and first and most importantly, I remember looking up and then she knelt down and got on our level. And then she gently and lovingly calmed us down first, you know, so we weren't shouting and crying and, you know, gimme, gimme, calmed us all down. And then very rationally, very lovingly pointed out that there were three of us, one, two, three, only one of this toy that we were playing with. Uh, so we could either learn to share this toy, take turns, or look around. You've got all those other toys that we could bring in and, and we, could, we could do that. But we're not gonna just fight over this. We're going to, we're gonna learn to share. And Joe, she said, we're gonna learn to share and there's enough to go around. And that made sense to me then, it makes sense to me now, the lesson that I learned is the same lesson that your viewers have really learned as children. We just have to learn to share. We have to learn to care about other people's feelings. When we do that, we will fully come to know our own humanity. And that really ought to be what government ought to be, the expression fully of our humanity in the public context. Isn't that what we deserve? I'm in, brother. Let me jump a little bit here in this surprising direction. As we make public the giant public corporations, among those corporations are not only the uh, oil companies, but the media companies. And here's our opportunity to rescue our culture from something that I invite us to consider what it is we got to rescue it from. I would call it commercialism, but that doesn't help that much. What we're really talking about is a system of status mm -hmm. based on criteria that are in favor of the rich, um, looks, um, the rest of it is quite confusing. The, I mean, what Hollywood has done to our collective uh, conscience. And so what we're trying to do here is urge the rescuing of our culture mm -hmm. so that we do bring about human beings that care, that use their intelligence to, if they have a, a company, a corporation, that they're using that, they're thinking how to best make things happen good for people. And we should have a dynamic that is developed our culture mm -hmm. that's making those kind of things happen. Is there language we can offer? Or let me go this next step. Can you imagine the Wall Street people winning the whole American public to the proposition that our government is in a terminal state of corruption? All three branches that Citizens United is such a disgrace that um, we could start from scratch with new people in the Supreme Court but that's too strong a language maybe for somebody who's still hoping they might do something good once in a while. Well, I would say this, Joe, that, that I know that right now I live in a racist, sexist, class oppressive society. I know that the economic institutions are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. So I know that those are, are true. And I also know that unless and until we bring these huge corporate entities to bear, we can't create the peaceful, just, compassionate world uh, and ecologically sustainable world I want. The huge transnational corporations are like a knife to our collective throat right now. So the first thing that we have to do is get them under control. And then we need to start to go about the business of creating a positive, affirmative, governing institutions and mechanisms that will actually reflect the world that you and I have just been having a conversation about. And I think that it's absolutely possible to do that. After all, you know, when's the last time you met a monarchist? Mm. I mean, 500 years ago, sovereignty rested all within one person on the divine right of kings. And 
and it was virtually unquestionable. And now, of course, today, you know, that uh, idea is ridiculous. So do I think it's possible? Can I imagine living in a genuinely peaceful, just, compassionate world that is ecologically sustainable? Damn right I can. And I think that uh, the fact that we're having this conversation is part of it. I know we're about to run out of time, so I want to actually make sure that we say this. Folks, the only reason you've been hearing this conversation is because you're listening, watching non-corporately filtered conversation. It's because it's democratic media. So if this conversation has excited you, I'd encourage you to do at least two things. One, go to that website, www.movetoamend.org. Sign up there so we can be in touch with you and you can be in touch with us. Or call us at 707 269-0984. The second thing I'd encourage folks to do is to look for opportunities to become media themselves. The fact that the internet is available to us, that that you've got things like Twitter and Facebook and, um, uh, and other such means to actually engage in conversation, then please do so. And frankly, isn't it about time that these, the, the, the YouTube started to be used for thoughtful political discourse as well as cute kittens? You know, uh, yeah. you know, I'd like to, I can't wait till the, the, the first uh, YouTube goes completely, totally viral that's not just witty. I like witty. I like cute kittens. But I'd like to actually see a short, concise uh, conversation about the need for nonviolent revolution in this country to go viral. That's when I'll know that uh, we're right on the cusp of winning. <sighs> so, you know, Joe, th- imagine now the Occupy movement. What we see in the, in my estimation, the occupation is not just a claiming of public space, which is brilliant in and of itself. And let's acknowledge that uh, the occupation is a manifestation of sincere political outrage. And this political outrage or this political anger is righteous. It's righteous because it's driven by uh, a sense of injustice associated with economic unfairness. And political outrage that is righteous is a good thing. It was political righteous anger that abolished slavery, that guaranteed women the right to vote, that, uh, that fought back in the trade union movement, the civil rights movement. Righteous political anger is a good thing because it requires us to act. So people are beginning to act. That's fantastic. It's also fantastic that this occupation movement is beginning to spread across the country and de- indeed across the world, and people are occupying public space wherever they live, work, and play, right? That's fantastic. Demands are coming out of them. That's fantastic. But even more deep and philosophically, it's, we're recapturing and reclaiming the public imagination. Mm. The imagination that we don't actually have to live like this. Yeah. And I, I take it that you've had a privilege of going down to the Occupy Wall Street and just walk up and down and have some conversations with people. It's, it is um, hope and optimism abounds, as does seriousness. I mean, the fact that people can be serious about revolution and joyful at the same time, the fact that people can be about making plans for how are we going to get fed and how are we going to take care of uh, the refuse that is produced? How are we going to actually make and implement our decisions here within this space? And how are we going to begin to collaborate and communicate with other efforts and other groups that are going on? All these kinds of conversations are taking place. It's phenomenal. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. And it's saying, imagine that we could do this on a global level. We start here and we begin to expand. You know, the empire is crumbling before our eyes, Joe. And what I'm seeing in these occupation movements are experiments in the kind of communities that can and should be built that are based upon the principles and values that you and I have been talking about. Wow. Sounds to me like uh, if you had become the Green Party president. Things would have been a lot better. Well, you know what? They would have been a lot better, Joe, but not necessarily because I was the president. Because let's just be honest. If if somebody who talks like me, no, I'm going to say it differently. When somebody gets elected 
president of the United States who talks like I'm talking right now, that will also be, they will be, she or he will be riding a wave and there'll, there'll be people elected to Congress who talks like this. There'll be thousands of state legislators who are talking like this. There'll be hundreds of thousands of local elected officials that are talking like this. We'll be in the process, not, the Green Party doesn't want to just get its hands on the mechanisms of power. We want to actually start to, to dismantle the existing institutions that are oppressive and creating more just and sustainable ones. So you're right that uh, when there is a Green Party uh, uh, president, uh, the world will be looking like a different place. You know, I um, tremble at uh, going a slightly different direction. Uh, I'm inviting uh, one to imagine replacing our Constitution with a direct democracy that we have uh, through the Internet idea, the proposition that we could have some number of people to give the role of uh, our, our leadership group, and oh, I, oh, I didn't even like that. That sounded bad. Um, actually, I ambivalent here. <laughs> First, I, I'd say let's imagine a group of people that we could have a national discussion with where they propose lots of these changes, and that we have also some mechanism where all the individual of society, they can say, oh, count me in on that group too. I have something to say, and there has to be a mechanism where one of my earlier ideas was if you think you got something worth the whole country hearing, you first try it out electronically on 10,000 people, and if they second your motion, try it out on a million people, and if they say this, the whole world should hear, then every individual has access to the general conversation that way. But I'm well, here's the thing. Uh, I mean, look, I'm willing to engage in these kinds of conversations to imagine them. Yeah. I, I would not propose it, and uh -huh. here's why. Uh -huh. uh, I am an engaged citizen, and I, I live my politics every day, and, and I like to go to meetings where important things are being held. I don't really think I want to be going to the meetings uh, where 10,000 people are participating in one way or another on certain decisions. I think that delegating responsibility as long as leadership is truly accountable i'm okay with that i want absolute liberation i want freedom but i also want the the opportunity to delegate uh whenever that actually makes sense and it sometimes makes sense uh, and in fact it often makes sense so um you know what you're describing in terms of just chucking a constitution and replacing it with mechanisms of direct democracy uh, upon first blush that sounds a little too radical. Well, not just too radical. It sounds like, wow, I don't know how that would even work. Let, you, me, let, let me offer, the, uh, if we've got time, yeah, yeah. these final thoughts, Joe. Good. I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh -huh. I want to thank you, the viewer, for paying attention to this conversation. And I want to thank the, the community access that has allowed us, we the people, to actually have this conversation.